Uh, my name is Josh Benoit I'm with ePlan, and uh, we have Sean Mulher, and we do Open Line Friday, um, which is a chance for you to ask questions. And and this is very exciting for us because this Open Line Friday is all about the power of Platform 2024, and we do this every year. We have changes to the platform. And Sean Mulher, and I, I'm going to have you talk about yourself and tell us what you do in just a second. I think that everybody knows you, though, already. I think everybody knows what you do, how long you've been here, but I like to reiterate it because it makes me feel like a young buck whenever whenever I say that. But Platform 2024 is something that Sean has been very invested in, and uh, I can't wait to get to it. So, Sean, let, let's talk about you for a little bit, uh, about how long you've been in ePlan and what your role is with Platform 2024. So I celebrated my 30 years of ePlan this month. So September 4th, 1993 is when I officially started at ePlan. So it's been a it's been a fantastic and fun journey for me. Uh, I remember that year. I was I think it was six. Uh, no, I'm kidding, kidding, <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but uh, my role at ePlan is international solutions architect, which is also it's kind of the same role as international technical product manager. So I'm part of the product management team helping uh, move ePlan forward, identifying what the requirements are from an international perspective, norms and standards and different types of processes and ways of working. And uh, I work with uh, our headquarters and also with all of our colleagues worldwide at the design, and identifying and understanding the requirements that they have. Very nice. And in, regards to, using... in regards to the platform 2024, so it's been, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and fun to prepare it and make sure the development is uh, is going through and presenting all of these new features. And uh, since September, no, August, August 28th, the platform's been available, released. So if you are online, you don't have it yet, please go ahead and download the platform 2024 and start using it and enjoy the new features. We really want to dive into platform 2024 and, and whatever you've heard about it, this will be uh, a session that really takes you through exactly uh, what those enhancements are and how they're going to work for you. Sean does a really great job of explaining that. So I'll kind of hand off and we'll have some questions along the way for him. I'll be monitoring the chat. So uh, please, if you if you have something that you want to ask, then uh, please do. We, we'd love to have that interaction. So, uh, Sean, I'll, I'll let you kind of take it away. All right. So let's dive right in. So let's start with one of the larger topics, which is IEC standards. And you're probably familiar with the IEC standards. And one thing that people don't quite uh, understand is IEC is not a European standard. A lot of time IEC is always associated with kind of German design standards or European design standards, but IEC is International Electrotechnical Committee. And it really is an international standard. And the United States, as a matter of fact, is part of the IEC a committee as a member, as a full member. So um, if you want to adopt the IEC standards, feel free to do so. And it can really help you design a lot more efficiently and standardized. So in that aspect, the 81346 provides you with ways of structuring your systems and ways of labeling also your devices. And with the latest IEC standard, we went to three letter codes. So B, you have B for general sensors, or a sensing object, you have BA for an element, which is potential sensing object. And now you have subclasses such as BAA and BAB for a very specific type of product, whether it's a voltage transformer or a voltage relay. And in ePlan, of course, we support the IEC 81346, but one of the requests was, well, I never know which letter code to use. And if you open up the system, you can go to identify subclasses, and now we provide you with a table, a full table with all of the identifiers. And the nice thing too is you have a filter so you can search for a specific identifier and you can see exactly what the description of that identifier is. And we've added a user specific comments column. So if you want to, or you know in your company, we always use that particular code for this particular product. You could put a comment in there and then the user would see that comment and know exactly which identifier to use. So in the software, if you just double click on a system or on a system, on a symbol, you right click on the symbol, you have identify subclasses. I go right in here and then you can see it already filtered on the FC, the one that's currently being used. And it gives you overcurrent protecting object by metal, by circuit, uh, by metal circuit fuse, a description. But in the comments, I also added ePlan. 
So let me search for ePlan. So I could do an ePlan search right here. And you can see it pulls up all of the ePlan comments that I have. So now I could figure out which one are the most commonly used identifiers for maybe that particular application. So a nice little feature to help users jump into the IEC standard and get familiar with it without necessarily learning it by heart right from the get-go. How do you like the IEC 81346, Josh? You see, whenever you first started talking about this, and I, I've heard it for a little while now, I, I think about you know, how, how do you get this numbering system, the 81346, and I'm not an engineer, we all know that. And so I was thinking, is there anybody that's going to understand what that means? But I've seen you uh, give this information out and, and do this before where whenever you're talking to engineers, they know exactly what you're saying. So I, I don't I, I feel like I'm just excluded because I'm not an engineer and it's not excluding everybody else. So it's good that you got you go through this. You need to label a particular device. How do you label it? What kind of codes do you use and letters and numbers? And the IEC really provides you a solid foundation to help you guide through that. Instead of guessing, you really have a solid numbering system that you can use. So I think also the comment engineer. function, that whenever you can look up, whenever you put a comment, and I wish that this was available for, for our, this is something I would use every day, is that whenever you can have the comments and it pulls up exactly what you're looking for, I think that's invaluable. Absolutely. Next, sub-project management. So when we talk about sub-project management, in ePlan you can create projects. Do you know what is the largest project ever created in ePlan, Josh, by any chance? Well, how many, you're talking about how many pages? Yeah. I would be lying if I said I remembered. Yeah. So the largest project ever created was 27,000 pages. So one of these projects has 27,000 sheets in it. So it's really not necessarily one single person that's going to be managing that project. So you will have multiple users working on one project. Now, the challenge has always been, it's like, I would like to maybe segregate certain parts of the project and um, offload them to some other, some other colleagues. So you can create these sub projects in ePlan. And up until now, creating these subject, these sub projects has been a little challenging because from a configuration perspective, you always have to remove a, remove a specific one and add a new one and then remove that and then add a new one. Now what we have is we've got what we call over, overlapping areas. So you can create all of your different sections that you want to offload. And then as you need them, you simply just select the configuration, offload your project, and then you can reload it back into ePlan without having to go through the whole removing and reinserting process. So a so much easier you management. When you say sub, does that just mean that means like these are projects, but these are if you have teams like teams working on sub one, teams on sub two and sub three, they're able to see the overall project as well. And the other or, or it does it go by what user access they have? If they have if they have access to the full project that they can give you both. But a lot of times maybe the sub one project might be a specific supplier and he only sees his area. And then when he sends it back to the operator, then the operator sees the whole thing and he sees the sub one, sub two, sub three as well. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so these overlapping areas really make it easy to segregate the project into smaller chunks and have everyone you work on them at uh, different times or at their own pace. Then since 2022, you remember we introduced this new interface, the new user interface with for the platform, which is ribbons driven. And we also added this tell me what you want to do kind of box. And it's a bit of a, in, in the AutoCAD world or in the CAD world, you had this command line where you would type in your command and you could enter whatever you needed. Well, in ePlan, you don't really have that command line. But now if you're looking for something specific, you can go to the tell me what you want to do, enter a keyword, and it'll pull up all of the specific functions or actions that you can perform with that keyword. And to transition from version 2.9, which was a menu-driven tool, to version 2024 or 2022, as a matter of fact, we wanted to know where is the where are those particular functions located so I can navigate the ribbon bars a lot easier. And now within those particular actions, we've highlighted where those particular devices are located. So if I jump into ePlan and I type in here terminal, for example, and I just go with my mouse over it, you can see exactly where that particular function is located within my toolbars or my ribbon bars now, not toolbars anymore. So it makes it a lot easier for the user to find themselves. 
And also, we added this new translation settings. So in ePlan, if you want to access settings, it's an area of its own full of different settings. Kind of like if you have an iPhone, you go to the settings and you've got every possible settings in there. Well, we wanted to be able to access certain settings in certain contexts. And previously in ePlan, we had those settings for the parts management. Now we've added those settings as well for the translation. So if you go to master data, you got on the parts management, you remember you have your settings, so now I can quickly access the settings for parts management. But now if you want to translate a particular object or page or anything like that, you can simply go over here, highlight the translate button, and down here you've got your settings. So now you can modify the database that you're using, you can modify the extent of your settings, which pages are going to be translated, and also project independent settings. So all of that is accessible directly without having to navigate your entire settings of environment, making working with ePlan a lot easier. Hey, I have a question for you. I'm going to go backwards a little bit because we've got a question. Can can you have nested subprojects? Can you have nested subprojects? So if you have a project and you offload a subproject, the user could take that subproject and create another subproject off of it. So yes, you could have nested subprojects. And what happens is in the main project, everything is read only and you don't have access, you can't modify them, but as soon as you reload that project into the main project, then everything becomes available and editable. We also got a, another question about the, in the parts management for ePlan uh, P8 2024, the file handling are a little bit different than 2.9, the selected file are not highlighted. Um, that part you would know more than I would. <laughs> So yes, in the version 2022, we changed the parts management infrastructure. So the architecture of the parts database, because we actually came to our limits. So it was physically for us impossible to add a new column or add new properties to a part because it was based off of access. So we had to rethink our parts management system. So SQL is still available, but the internal parts management has changed. And now you can switch over to it and it's a lot faster and also, it's a lot more flexible to customize the visualization of the information. You know, what's interesting, and, and before you tee up the next topic, is I, whenever I was talking to you earlier this week, is we were having that conversation about the ribbon management or the, the ribbon structure coming over just a few years ago and, and to make this something that's more user-friendly. And you mentioned the fact that you were part of that team being the product owner, you're part of the team that went in and really looked at each piece to put it in the ribbon and find a place. And I, I mean, how painstaking was that? I haven't guessed how many functions this, so consider just this button a function in ePlan. I guess how many functions they were available in version 2.9. I You tell me. Over 2,000. Wow. So we had to transfer 2,000 of these functions from menu driven system, from menu driven to ribbons. And the question is, how do you organize them? What do you put in insert? What do you put in edit? Yeah. What do you put in view? So we had quite a few rounds and there was a lot of uh, arm wrestling to figure out who's going to win and who's going to have their particular share. So it wasn't just me alone. It was a team of colleagues that kind of helped lay this out. And we tried to organize them as, as logically as possible. It's probably not right. perfect, but I think we, uh, we achieved the goal of getting first the transfer over. And now we can always move things around if needed. But uh, yeah, it was quite challenging. Yeah, very cool. So next, let's move on to continuing our user experience improvement in the ribbon bars. Well, we have customized ribbon bars and the first initial transfer of the user interface, there was so much work that we did not necessarily implement a ribbon bar import and export functionality. So now this has been done in version 2024. So if you want to import your own ribbon bars, you can. You can customize the ribbon bars, import just one bar, and then export it and share it with other colleagues if needed. And in addition, also, you don't have to always have a icon with a menu. You can just have icons by themselves, which also makes the organization of information a lot easier. So in our new toolbar or in our new ribbons bar, I'm going to right click, do an import of my ribbon. And here I've got this wire properties, which is a ribbon bar, which has all of the colors and gauges and everything like that. And I'm going to import this toolbar and I'm going to say, where do I want to put it? Let's just put it here into right behind my cloud environment and hit okay. 
And now I've got my new ribbon bar, which is wire properties. And here, if I highlight a particular wire, I can quickly define the color. I can define the gauges in millimeter squared or in, gate in AWG. And I can set various different properties to that particular wire quickly and easily. So customized ribbon bars can easily be imported and exported in this new version 2024. Then we have the insert center. So the insert center is brand new in the, in the platform 2022, 23, and 24. And we've been making improvements as we go along with our uh, interactions with the software. And one of the missing features was the fact that I'd like to assign a particular part number to a symbol. So now I can go to, I can simply search for a particular device. So I can go into my electrical engineering. I'm looking for a protection device, maybe a circuit breaker from Alan Bradley. And then I can just simply select it, right click and hit assign. And then I can just highlight the symbol I want and just click on it and it'll automatically assign that part number onto that particular symbol. So it really makes the transfer of information from the parts management system onto the schematics easy and simple. It's almost like efficient engineering. Yeah, it is, absolutely. And another thing too, and I'm not sure if we, uh, well, I mentioned that in 2023, but under tags, you notice we just had one level tags before. Now you have multi-level tags. So I could select, for example, here machine layout, and then I could select another tag. So you can um, cascade tags inside of tags. So you can have like a breadcrumb navigation capabilities to make your organization of data a lot easier as well. In the parts management, we also have a new view available. So it's not necessarily new because it was available in version 2.9, but we hadn't implemented yet. So in the version 2024, we have this combination view. So today we only have, or before we only had the tree view or the list view. Now we have a combination of both. So I can click on a particular section. I can see the list view and I can access that quickly. So for that, let's go to our parts management system. And in the parts management system, I can visualize the perk of working with multiple different screens. <laughs> you never know which screen you're the window is going to show up on. So here, if I go to electrical engineering, go to components, and I highlight, for example, my protection devices, you can see down here, it loads all of the data inside of your table. So a nice and quick and easy way to access the information inside of your parts management system. You know, that looks, that's a, it has the look of Adobe. I don't know if you've ever seen in the, in the back end of uh, Adobe, whenever you're using Photoshop, or if you're using, uh, for me, Premiere Pro for editing videos, this is the same kind of layout that, that it's so easy to get uh, to the information and to navigate that way that it, I, I don't know, I don't know if the idea came from that, but it's very, very similar and so user friendly. Well, the word easy was one of our driving forces, right? Because we want to try and access the North American market, Asian markets that are familiar with tools that have those types of navigation system or ease of use. And the idea was really to make the user environment as easy as possible so that new users can jump in and discover it quickly. So that was one of the main goals. Gotcha. Terminal management. So terminals are little devices which are extremely important in the control design environment because they help you connect typically components that are inside of the control cabinet to field devices or also in europe it's very common to land every single wire on a terminal strip and then from the terminal strip also go back into the control cabinet and connect additional devices terminal strips are used as well for testing you can easily go into those little slots here and test whether there's a signal or not or whether everything is connected properly so it's a very useful system inside of ePlan. Well, in ePlan, if you work with terminals, let me show you what it looks like. Those are these little devices here. So you have to place them everywhere and identify them. So it can be hundreds, if not thousands of terminals in any given project. And they're all over the place. So what we've got in ePlan is we've got a terminal editing aspect, which helps you to visualize the entire terminal strip in one spot. No matter where, this could be on page 10, this could be on page 20, this could be on page 50, I really don't care. You see the entire strip as you want to handle it and manage it. So in that particular aspect, we've already got some functions and features. However, we needed to expand those features. And in this case, in version 2024, we now able to add new terminal, but as part numbers. Previously, you could add just regular terminals, one, two, three, four, but now you can actually specify 
the part number behind it and really create a logical terminal strip. Additionally, we've got the go to functionality as well that can help you quickly from this environment select a terminal and navigate to that terminal quickly and easily as well. So now I could go here to my uh, particular system, open up a page, I highlight a terminal. Now I could go to my terminal strip editor and there I see my terminal strip. And if I want to go to terminal number 11, right click go to graphics and it jumps right to the next page and locates that terminal and highlights it for me. So really quickly and easily I can jump back and forth between the editor and my schematics. In addition, if I wanted to also, if I made a mistake, for example, let's say I forget to add a terminal number for this one, I can right click and I can generate a check, check terminal strip. So now I can go ahead, select a configuration for my terminals and validate these terminals. And here you can see terminal without designation. So it highlights an error inside of my terminal strip. So this is also in conjunction with the error checking, which is very powerful in ePlan to help you validate your schematics and make sure you don't make any mistakes. Because you know we're perfect, Josh, right? We never make mistakes. So that's really well, not, you, not even- You are. <laughs> I wish, I wish. I, I think that, no, 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 you, you're the one that told me that. So that's how I know. No, oh, oh, oops, oops. That was a private conversation, Josh. I don't think anybody <laughs> agreed, by the way. No, I don't think anybody would agree. So <laughs> yeah. I, fixed, I fixed Terminal 4, I updated it, and now if you look at the test, you see the error is gone. So you can fix and check for errors directly in the terminal editing system. So as, as well as checking for the errors, you also can handle your alignable accessories. When we talk about alignable accessories or accessories that you can add that's going to change the length of the terminal strip, and that can be done easily now in this terminal editor. So the idea is when you're working with terminals in ePlan, just place the terminals, just drop them where you need them, and afterwards all of the entire configuration, just simply go to your terminal strip editor and do all of your management from there. It's much easier, it's visual, and you've got tons of functionality to make sure everything's correct. Then we have machine cabling. So when we talk about machine cabling, we typically talk about all the cables that are connecting the motors or sensors on the machine back to the control cabinet. Or we also talk about cables that are connecting two junction boxes, for example, together. And one of these challenges when you work with cables is what do you do with spare conductors? So it's very rare that you really always have the exact cable that matches the configuration that needed, especially when you have 20 sensors and you want to bring all of those signals back to the control cabinet. Typically, you always add like 10% spare conductors because you never know in the future if you're going to add some sensors on the field or not. Now, today, a lot of users will be like, okay, I'm just going to bundle them out, put some sticky tape around them and hide them in the bottom of the control cabinet, right? So nobody sees them and they don't interfere with anything. Well, challenge there is you might have some noise or if those con conductors you know touch the control cabinet you might create some weird phenomenon in there so the idea and also from a standards perspective is to say i want to land every single one of those conductors on a spare terminal so i want to so to do that in eplan you'd have to create spare terminals on both sides and then you'd have to take each one of those conductors and land it on those spare terminals so it is possible in ePlan, but it's a tedious work. It's tedious work to make sure that everything's connected. So now using ePlan version 2024, we've got an automated functionality to be able to help you with that. And let's see how that works. Automate the automation, right, Josh? You know, this reminds me of Sean is what? this is organizing your junk drawer. You know, whenever you have the drawer, that one drawer at your house that you throw things in that you're going to need for later. Yeah, but they just, it's just it's it's crazy messy. And then every once in a while you go and you organize it. OK, well, I'm not going to use this or I'll put this here and, and you make it look good. That's what this is. Pretty much, pretty much help you do your due diligence without too much effort. So here's my cable. I've got four spare conductors and I've got two terminal strips, X1 and X2. And right now I'm only using four terminals on each side. So those four spare conductors need to be landed on X1 and X2 respectively. So I generated a little cable connection diagram here showing me the current status. And let's see what happens. I'm going to highlight my cable. We've got this functionality here that's called connect cable connections. So if it's not available already on the ribbons, 
you can add it by going to customize ribbons and you should find it here under the menu connections and in the menu connections you have this option connect cable connection so you can add that to any ribbon that you want if you don't know where it's at i've already done that work so now i'm going to highlight my cable and now i'm going to select create or connect cables and here we've got four cable connections that were connected, eight terminals that were created and edited. So now you can see they are not placed. So this symbol indicates that it's not placed in the schematics, but they exist as objects in the database. So now if I was to go ahead and update this report, what you would see is you would see that now my cable is perfectly connected, even though I didn't do any changes in my design. So some little automated features that can help users make sure that the designs are complete. And one of the biggest features on Platform 2024 is the option of calculation. So you remember all of those blackboards from school probably, Josh, right? No, I still use those at home. My my 12-year-old has questions about math all the time. And so I show him how to work the math that I learned when I was growing up, and he has no idea what I'm doing. So we have to, I mean, we we really do have a little blackboard that we use for it. And he shows me how to do it the right way. Like what? We're getting the right. We're getting the same answer, bro. <laughs> I think I think you should just uh, use AI now. I mean, you just ask AI, and AI will not only give you the result, but will probably give you all the steps how to get the results. It's it's. Well, that happens it's, whenever it's he goes to high easy. school. It's whenever easy. he goes to high school, I'm gonna have to use AI because I don't know the answers anymore. Yeah, it's. If, I mean, thank goodness I say AI didn't exist back in my days. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have learned anything. <laughs> not that I know much. But anyways, electrical calculation is an important aspect of controls design. And today, if you want to do calculations, you take the data from ePlan, you export it to Excel most of the time. And in Excel, you can add all of your formulas, do your calculations, and the results can then be transferred back into ePlan. So that's a kind of tedious workflow depending on what you're trying to calculate. Well, now with ePlan, we've added this directly into the platform. So we're using the block properties. So block properties is a fancy word to say something really, really configurable and powerful. And uh, not every user knows directly how to use them, but if you get uh, familiar with them, they are extremely powerful and can help you do many, many things. And block properties allow you to access information from connected objects. So if I have two objects connected to each other with block properties, I can jump through the connection and then over to the other object and look at the information connected to it. So really, really powerful. And now with the 2024, we've added the calculation capabilities. So whether it's arithmetic functionality, mathematical functions, comparison operators, and Boolean operators, even statistical functions, they are all available in the platform 2024. We can yeah, let's like, tell you, Rupe, hey, ahead. before you go on, I got to let you know that, that I don't know much about block properties. No. But David Rigel, who works with us told me I, I walked up to him uh, i think it was at the office in schaumburg a few weeks ago and he said when can i be on open line friday because i have the the best topic my favorite thing to talk about i'm like you know what what would it, what, what would be his favorite thing and he goes block properties i could talk about all day i like that i like that so i said i said oh okay well let's make this happen so our next open line friday we got David on talking about block properties. I'll join for sure and ask lots of questions in the chat. It's great, great. <laughs> so one of the aspects of calculation is voltage drop of cables. So the reason why you calculate voltage drops is you wanna make sure that the voltage supplied at the breaker box also arrives to the end component. So if you have a motor out on the field and you have a 30 foot cable, if you don't have enough voltage, well, the motor is not going to perform as required. So you need a minimum amount of voltage to come through. So those are the type of calculations that electrical engineers need to do based on the length of the cable. So there's different types of complicated formulas to be able to calculate it and making sure that it's there. But now you can enter these formulas in ePlan using the block properties and giving you a reliable value. Also full loaded amps. How many amps are getting to my motor when it's starting or how many is he actually using? So there are various different calculations and you can enter those in ePlan. So how does this work? Well, let's take a look here in my drawing. I'm gonna go over to a calculations sheet and do uh, 
opened up the wrong project. Give me a second here. This is the first time you've done this, I'm guessing. Absolutely. absolutely. Never do that. <laughs> By the way, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the chat or the Q&A. So, here we go. Where are we? Do, oh, of course. Wrong navigator. It's okay, it's Friday. We That's forgive right. you. That's right. So here we go. So here's your power supply. Here's a main circuit breaker. Here's a bus bar. And then you're going off to a protection device. And from X1 here, you go into the motor on the field. So let's say you have a pump system. You have a pump all the way out there in next to a, a lake or a water system. And for currently the design is called for a 50 meter cable. And this 50 meter cable based on this particular formula I have here, Kind of gives me a voltage drop of 2.41 volts at a it's a 0.6 percent voltage drop so let's take a look at what this looks like in the current situation here we've got our calculation properties if i click on these three dots i can view this a little closer we've got this new calculation object and then here i can visualize my entire calculation so here's a divided here's a multiply sign here's a square root sign or square sign and here are the values the preview calculated values so you can walk through the formula and as you walk through it will kind of guide you with the results so it kind of helps you to put these formulas together and you can select from any type of mathematical function arithmetic function easily and put things together so i put this calculation together and this kind of calculates my voltage drop for my cable so let's say I have to move this pump now, it's going to be 150 meters away from my motor or from my power source. I'm going to change 150 in the length, confirm with OK. And now if I just simply update my connections, which will give me a new calc, and there we have it, 7.3 volts, and now it's 1.81%. So the standards, if you look at the standards books, it'll tell you you cannot have more than, depending on the standards, either 3% or 5% voltage drop on any given actuator and in this case we're well in the range so i'm still good to use my 150 meter cable on this particular example another example would be power or distribution branches you have a main circuit breaker and then i want to define certain branches so i'm going to have a branch protector so i'm just going to drop in a few in here and i need to figure out what are the total amps needed on my main circuit breaker so if i drop the first one i'm going to select this is going to be a 10 amp branch I'm going to drop in a second one. This is going to be a 5 amp branch. I'm going to drop in a third one. I'm going to say this is going to be a 1 amp. And I'm going to have one final one, which is going to be 20 amps. So now I want to figure out how what is the total amps needed for the main one. And now all I have to do is simply update my connections. And there you have it, a total amp of 28.8 at a concurrent factor of 0.8 meaning that not all of these branches are going to be activated at the same time. So I added a concurrent factor of 0.8 to make sure it was accurate. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty impressive. Yeah, pretty impressive, dude. I like That's it like, a lot. This again, again, this goes back to our easy. The, the, the key word is easy. Well, easy is easy probably in this particular aspect is a different different meaning because you really are in block properties and block properties are not necessarily the easiest property to use. However, once you get into them and start understanding how they work, then it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, but when you have something that's doing the calculations like that, that to me, that would be easy. That is <laughs> Better than, than having to do it um, the old way. Or yep. The old, old way. Someone did ask about how to get signed up for the Open Line Friday about block properties. We actually are going to communicate that on our LinkedIn. Uh, if you if you're not part of our LinkedIn, go to uh, ePlan on LinkedIn. You can uh, do a search for us and and find us. We put out information just about every day. Uh, a lot of uh, great information about what's coming up. Uh, maybe some stuff that Sean's covered in the past. Uh, always good uh, stories about uh, with some successes that we've had, not only in the U.S., but around the world. So uh, it's great to to kind of get informed if you're on our LinkedIn page, uh, for sure. Thanks, Josh. So in regards to the block property calculation, we also have some additional features such as the 
know, calculus or statistical values like counting and adding up and median and things like that. And in particular, when we talk about pre-planning, the counting aspect is an important one because when you design your system in pre-planning and you start capturing all of your actuators in a process system, you could capture, for example, your pumps. On a machine layout, you would create, you would calculate or try to capture all of your motors and sensors. And you would like to know for a particular section, how many pumps do I have or how many motors do I have and what is the total output of those motors so that I can get an idea if I have a motor control center or a power distribution panel, how much power I need to provide for those various sections. So now using the block properties, you could say for HW1 here, I want to calculate all of my motors. So you can say how many sensors you have, how many actuators you have, how many IOs, and also the total output power. It can be calculated directly here and visualized. So that really gives users in EPAD a much better feel. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to go to my drawing here. And here we've added, so out of my structure, my pre-planning pre structure here, for example, HW1. I placed a box that represents HW1, and now I can say how many sensors do I have, how many actuators do I have. All of that can be automatically calculated using the new calculation block properties. So here you have it. Here's your calculation. So I've got various different ones. And here I'm, for example, counting the amount of sensors I have in this particular segment. Cool stuff. So much fun, and I can't wait for my users to start giving us feedback and usage examples that they've implemented in their projects to help them with calculating. So how do people do give you that feedback? Since, since you really take what you get and whenever someone gives you that feedback and you're re relaying it to uh, HQ or to a bigger team, how do people reach out to you and find you in order to do that? So there's multiple different ways. As a default, when you're an ePlan customer, you have access to the ePlan Support Center. In the ePlan Support Center, you can write a ticket, and that ticket then goes into the system and is answered by our tech support team, second level support, or if it's a wish, it actually comes over to me, and I can visualize what the requirements are, and I can interact with the customers then if further details are needed. Otherwise, you can always send me an email. Also on LinkedIn, I'm kind of going LinkedIn quite a bit. So if you want to put a post on LinkedIn, and I see my customers or our customers kind of post things and little features that they've done with ePlan. So it's kind of neat from that perspective. So multiple different avenues that can be used to, to reach me if needed. The other question we get is how do you how do you create a ticket or submit a ticket? And there's there's a video that I'll post with this whenever whenever I post this video this actual video you're doing right now to YouTube. And yeah. if you go to our YouTube channel, it tells you exactly how to create a ticket. So well, it makes it very easy plan, for you. We, we've actually implemented that directly in the user interface. So if you go yeah. over here to help, then you mm -hmm. have support and updates, and you can create a ticket right out of ePlan. So you click on this button, and it'll guide you right through it. So Exactly. Mm -hmm. That easy. Easy button. So we also added additional replacement text tables. I don't know if you're familiar with the replacement text tables. What these are is the ability to say, if a property has a specific value, like one, I don't want to use one as a value, but I want to output some kind of text associated to one. And it's like lookup tables, kind of. And in here, here's an example. We have a property replacement text. And if I go into it, it'll see if, I, if the value of the source text is two, then output H. If the value of the source text is six, then output V. So you can have these replacement text tables. And up to now, we only had 10 of these. And customers were requiring more because they like the block properties and the replacement text. So we've added up to 100 of those so far. So you can now add all sorts of different tables, lookup tables if you need to, and work with them. And finally, user-defined properties. I can create properties in ePlan. That's nothing new. But now you can create your own block properties as a property associated to your project. So again, that makes working with ePlan a lot easier, and you don't have to create them every single project. You can define them once and make them part of your standard. Then we have the PLC management, so symbolic address. So the symbolic address is like what they call the tag. If you look at software programming, you always have to associate an input with a tag, which is a, a variable definition. And ePlan can generate these tags automatically, or I'd say automagically, if 
you want to use the ePlan e -plan term. And these, these tags can be a combination of multiple different properties. In this case, you could use the location designation, the higher level function, the function definition, and then combine them together to the entire tag. And up until now, it was pretty rigid the way it was set up, but now we've added some flexibility. Now you can move them around, you can put the location before the function, and you can shift things around to make it a lot easier for the user to understand. So adding flexibility to the design. And then we have the export to Excel. So again, export to Excel is nothing new. And also since version 2022, we've added a new interface, which gives you a lot more flexibility where you don't even need Microsoft Excel, but you could use Google Sheets, for example, and Excel can, or ePlan can export that file and you can open it directly into Google Sheets, for example. So really neat without having Excel. But Excel is a lot of times a tool of choice. And for I.O. lists, a lot of users use I.O. lists in Excel. And in ePlan, we are now opened up the export to Excel directly out of the I.O. listing inside of ePlan. So again, minimize the number of steps that need to be performed and made it a lot easier for the user. And if you're familiar with Automation ML, well, if you're not, Automation ML is a XML file format. And the XML file format allows you to store data. And the idea behind Automation ML is to create a neutral data interface between various different software solutions. In the market, you have ePlan Electric P8, you have Fluid, you have uh, Autodesk, you have all sorts of different solutions out there and multiple different data formats. And when you try and combine those, it's a nightmare because you have different uh, data standards. And the Automation ML is the idea to say, let's just dump everything in an Automation ML format and every other software tool can just pick and choose what information it wants out of there. And in the area of PLCs, Automation ML has now been is now getting more and more standardized and multiple different software tools are using it. So now for our Asian market, we have the Automation ML interface for Omron. So the Omron software solution has added the Automation ML import capability. And with P8, you can export to Automation ML. So now you can transfer data directly from P8 through Automation ML into Omron development software. So making the transfer of data again between different tools a lot easier. Is this something new? Is AML new? AML is not new. It's been around for quite a few years. And, and the idea is, again, to really have some kind of neutral data storage where all of the tools of any given company can just fill in the data and then other tools can just pull that data from there. So it's really I, not that new. I only ask because I was I had a meeting with someone earlier this week and they had never heard of an AML file before, but we walked them we walked them through how how it's how it's used or or how we were pulling the data from one place to the other. And I forget what application we were using, but they had never heard of AML before. Like it was like it was something brand new. Well, the, the challenge with AML is AML only works if you've got sophisticated tools to be able to import and export data. If you use CAD applications to do all of your schematics, then AML is completely irrelevant because you can't really take the I.O. data from your DWG files or your DXF files and put them in an AML file. It's kind of challenging because the data is missing in the first place. So that's why if you're not working with your data driven tools, then automation ML is really irrelevant for you and you probably never heard of it. So it really doesn't necessarily surprise me if you're not using those tools. Uh, something else is that we we uh, Kruna put in the in the chat your YouTube, which has a lot of great information. Um, we we have a few different areas where you can get information about ePlan and and some of these the questions that you might have that you know maybe maybe the question comes up after we're done with this uh, webcast and you want to you want to ask and and so you can go to Sean's but uh, we have our own YouTube for ePlan but. Even even Cruno, he has his uncle Cruno uh, ePlan Essentials, which is fantastic. So there are a lot of different ways for you to get that information that you're looking for uh, on YouTube, whether it's the official ePlan channel or Sean's channel or or Cruno's. Cruno has gotten a lot of attention. I think that Sean, you're probably a little jealous of him. I am. I am. He's doing a really good job. He does all of the nice little intros and outros and animations, and I don't have that type of skill, so. 
my my <laughs> videos are pretty bland. They're like, okay, here it is, and end of it. <laughs> so he does a really good job. He does. <laughs> then we have in the ePlan pre-planning environment the ability now to add part numbers to PLT functions. Previously, every time you created a loop and a loop function, you would always have to add a pre-planning object to carry the part number. Now you really don't need that anymore. And directly in the function, you can add your part number. And that simplifies the amount of data created in pre-planning and makes the information a lot clearer and more structured. So a nice little feature for the user. Then we move on to ProPanel. So ProPanel is our solution to design control cabinets in 3D. Who would have thought with it 3D was that easy, right? Well, ProPanel kind of shows it to you and makes it easy. Actually, Uncle Kruno shows you as well how it's used and made easy as well. So that's pretty. He easy. does. He does. Yeah. So from a 3D perspective, what was missing up until now? Well, we did not have our little navigation cube, and with version 2024, we have it now. So we can easily access specific views and navigate our 3D model without having to use the mouse. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So here's my control cabinet. And we've also, so I can click on the cube surfaces. I can click on the edges here, and then I can access the bottom edges. I can also access the bottom points. So depending on where you click, you can easily access that particular view. But if you click on home, you can always navigate back to the original view. In terms of functionality, we've also have the 3D, the middle mouse button. So you see here, I'm clicking on the middle mouse button and I can easily navigate or move the control cabinet, which before I always had to select that particular view. And if I need to move the cabinet, I hold the shift key, and with the shift key and the middle mouse button, I can easily move my control cabinet. So we made the usage of the mouse a lot easier. That's a setting, so if you don't like that type of behavior, you can always go back to the old one, the traditional one, and switch it to your default if you want in the setting. You know, the kids would say, that's clean. Yes, it's clean, very nice. Then we have this Mind the Gap. Have you ever been to London, Josh? Not yet, hopefully soon. Uh, yes, you have to go to London. London is a really cool city. And if you go to London and you ride the underground in London, you'll see all these signs everywhere, Mind the Gap. And you even hear it in the speakers constantly all day long. It's like, Mind the Gap, Mind the Gap. And what does that mean? It means that you have to mind the gap between the platform and the train so your foot doesn't get stuck in it, right? And what does this have to do with ePlan, you ask? That, I don't know, that they're driving a train to ePlan? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. We can do the controls design for the trains as well, but that's beside the point in this particular aspect. Mind the gap is the ability to reduce, if you look in the pro panel environment, when you lay out your control cabinets, you might have some gaps between your components. And when you're doing your design, you just drop components on the back plate and you drop them on the DIN rails. You don't really care about all those, those, those gaps. But at the end, you probably want to clean it up and remove them. So now we've got a functionality in pro panel that, is fill, that fills those gaps. So you can highlight those devices, click on the button, and it automatically reduces those gaps, which really cleans up your control panel and your controls design. So now that we have that feature in ePlan, now we can remove the tag and say now it's called fill the cap and not mind the cap. I'm not sure if the London Underground would be happy with that one, but anyways, we've got it in the plan. Yeah, I don't think it works that way. Whenever you're, uh, whenever you you have the gap for a, a train, nobody wants that filled, bro. No, that's right. <laughs> so if I open up my mounting panel and take a look, now I can use the cube to look at the front view. I want to close the gap between these different devices, so I can simply highlight this. And here now under my edit menu, there is lineup without gaps. And if I click on that, I select the device that I want to use as my source. And there you have it. It kind of closes the gaps cleanly and easily. So nifty. You know, let me, I, I know that, that we're running, you know, we have a little bit of time left, but let, can I ask you real quick, why is that important though? If if there's gaps and why why do you, why would you want the gaps to be taken out? Well, let's say, for example, if you take this particular uh, environment right here, right, you want to place a component that's a little wider than these gaps. Well, if you look at them individually, you say, I can't place a component on this tin rail because I don't have all of the space. So now you would have to take this and move each component individually. Now you can just close the gaps and it'll give you exactly the space and enough space for you to place new components that are wider. 
So it's really made from an engineering perspective. A lot of okay. Things. But good question, John. And then we have the weight calculation. So, you know, after Christmas, it's always a challenge. Now it's like, okay, let's go and, uh, and get physical and run around and try and lose all of those good meals that we've ate over Christmas. Well, control panels are no different, right? They gain a lot of weight. And that's only when you start putting components on the back plate and on the din rails and you're filling it with stuff. And the idea is to be able to calculate the total weight if you want to ship a control cabinet from the US to Europe or vice versa, then you need to know exactly what is the weight. And the weight is not just the components, but it's also the din rails, depending on the length of them. It's also the wire ducts, and it's also the individual wires. Like if you know an interesting fact in a car, the heaviest component of a car is the wire harness. That wire harness weighs a lot on a particular car. You wouldn't think about that, but yeah, the wires carry a lot of weight. I mean, they're all copper typically. So in this case, you want to know the weight. Well, in ePlan, you just click on a button, and then you can have all of the weight of the control cabinet calculated wow. automatically. It's pretty cool, huh? Is it, uh, I, I see that it's in kilograms right here. Is it always uh, calculated in kilograms? You can have it in kilograms or you can also display it. There's different features to be able to display it in pounds. And there's a default settings in ePlan that can also be displayed in pounds. So that's just a setting of the project being an IEC project in this case. We, we just got a question that uh, is it possible to get information of the weight center? The Yes, that's uh, I've had that question a few times. Currently, not uh, it's not available as a default automated functionality, but that's something that uh, we've already given feedback to the development and who knows when that can. Platform 2025? Oh, I wouldn't be so sure, but who knows? I'm not gonna make any promises. So there you there you have it. So these are kind of a in summary all of the features available in 2024 at a glance. And of course, if you go to eplan.help, so if you type in eplan.help and you go to the platform, there you can find all of the news. So you'll find all of the details. So there's a lot more details in there, and you can read that, and it'll give you all the information of the news on the platform 2024. So download it, install it, use it, abuse it, and take advantage of all of those new features that we have now for 2024.